Walker of Worlds podcast. My name's Rachel and this is the podcast where we step behind the veil to take a look at some long lost and little known spooky stories and urban legends. And this is your Halloween special. It's a long one so feel free to get yourselves a drink, get comfortable, sit back and enjoy. Today we're venturing into Broadhaven, a village and seaside resort in the southeastern corner of St Bride's Bay in Wales. Broadhaven and nearby Little Haven have a combined population of just under 1,500 people. Like many parts of Wales, Broadhaven is incredibly picturesque. It has a west-facing beach which is popular with families and surfers alike. Green hills dotted with cottages roll up from the coast and dry stone walls wind along the roads. You can see why 140,000 people visit the area every year. But as with every tale, we're not here to talk about how beautiful an area is, nor how many visitors a town can attract. We're here to talk about the things that lurk in the dark and threaten to ruin your dreams. Welcome to the Broadhaven Triangle. February 1977 seemed to be just like any other February in the British Isles. The sky was overcast and drizzle pattered on winter-soaked ground, yet spring was just around the corner. The days were becoming longer and snowdrops were beginning to ease their way through the soil. Elvis Presley's Suspicious and Leo Sayers When I Need You were both in the UK's top 10 that week. Just a week previous, EMI had sacked the Sex Pistols and Jimmy Carter had become the 39th President of the United States. Everyone was probably glad that January was over and that spring and summer were on their way. February 4th, 1977 began like any other day at the local school, but it was the day that would change all of the lives of everybody in that little building. At around lunchtime, 14 children, most of them boys, were outside playing football when they witnessed a UFO landing just outside of the school fence. Several of them would also witness a humanoid figure in a silver suit exit the craft and stand beside it. They described the spacecraft as a silver cigar-shaped object. Some even claimed that the roof of the UFO had a dome complete with an orange light. Scared by what they'd seen, they ran back into the school and told the headmaster what they'd seen. At first, he was unsure as to whether they were telling the truth or if the sighting was just a schoolyard prank. However, a teacher who wished to remain anonymous also stated that she'd witnessed the UFO on the ground. School finished at around 3.30pm. When the pupils left the building, they discovered, much to their surprise, that the cigar-shaped craft was still on the ground. As they watched the craft, described as being about the size of a double-decker bus, it rose from the ground. In full view of the younger witnesses, it hovered for several minutes before disappearing behind the trees and out of sight. UFO investigator Randall Jones Pugh was able to interview one of the boys about an hour after the final sighting. The boy in question, David Davis, took Pew to the location and even though rainy weather had washed away any evidence, he was able to describe exactly what he'd seen. Pew was inclined to believe David as the young man was clearly terrified and his friends could back up his statement of what they'd seen in the schoolyard. Another of the boys told Pew about the silver-suited spaceman and how the being had just been staring down at the field as though studying it. Pew found this detail interesting as there had been a number of sightings of similar looking beings across England and Wales over the previous 12 months. The following day inspections were made of the area in order to see if the UFO had left any trace in the ground. As previously mentioned it had been a rainy day and any evidence had long since been washed away. However the telegraph pole that had been beside where the UFO had hovered had sustained damage and was found to be leaning at an angle. The incident took the world by storm with images of the craft that the children had drawn being featured heavily in the media. Each child who had witnessed the UFO had been asked to make a drawing of what they'd seen. As expected, each image was eerily similar. Those images are now held at the school and have been featured in news reports, movies, books, newspapers and every other kind of media. Eventually the attention began to melt away and life started to return to normal. Thursday the 17th of February was just another normal day in Broadhaven. Winter was continuing to melt away and even though it was a mere two weeks since the UFO sighting, the incident was already in the backs of people's minds. They were ready to forget about it and keep going with their lives. As with much of the year's early months, the weather was wet and rainy. It began at about 10.30am when the same object that had been sighted 14 days earlier returned. A teacher, who again wished to remain anonymous, signed a statement saying that she had seen an oval-shaped craft with a slight dome. The exterior appeared to be shiny metal with ridges around it. The craft made a humming noise as it disappeared into the nearby trees. 
Later on in the day, two dinner ladies claim to have seen a landed object on the school grounds. What's more, one of the dinner ladies claimed to have seen a figure enter the vehicle only moments before it rose into the air and disappeared with great speed. Roughly a month after the second sighting, a young man, Steve Taylor, would see a strange disc-shaped craft hovering overhead. He claimed that it was glowing orange and when he went outside to take a closer look, there was something else waiting for him. In a nearby field was a domed object that was strikingly similar to the one that had been sighted around the area several times before. Of more concern to the young boy was a tall being dressed in a shiny silver one-piece suit. This being was striding across the grass towards him. Now beyond terrified, Steve hit out at the figure. However, much to his surprise, the figure vanished before his fist could make contact. He turned and ran back to the house, immediately telling his family of the strange events as soon as he barged through the door. The school wasn't the only place that was being buzzed from strange craft from outer space. And this is the story that has been detailed the most. There are several books about the incidents that happened at Ripperston Farm. Ripperston Farm is about four miles south of Broadhaven. While bordered by other farms, this one has a feeling of remoteness with a view of the windswept cliffs and the sea beyond. At the time, the farm was owned by the Coombs family and, in early 1977, their lives were changed forever. And it's on Ripperston Farm where we're going to remain for the rest of this story. It was on January 14th, 1977, when, their fam- when the family had their first otherworldly encounter. That evening, Pauline Coombs witnessed a light hanging in the sky. Strange lights were not unusual as the farms located relatively close to several military installations. However, Pauline felt as though there was something strange about this light, and approximately 20 minutes later, the light started to swing side to side in a pendulum-like motion as it lowered itself towards the ground. Eventually it disappeared below the cliff and worried that something from one of the bases may have crashed, Pauline woke her husband in order to go and search for the object. Her husband Billy returned to tell her that he couldn't find whatever had gone over the cliff. The following day the newspapers were full of reports of UFO sightings. Although Billy didn't believe what, that his, what his wife saw was a flying saucer, he did believe that there were strange things happening in the local area. At the time, he was quoted as saying there were as many as 50 frogmen below the cliff, unmarked army trucks, soldiers in camouflage. The Navy was there too, building some sort of path beneath the water. This doesn't make sense. Clinton, the family's eldest son, commented on a strange humming noise that came from outside of the bathroom window. That sound was said to fill the room. On a dark evening, Pauline was driving home from Dale after dropping off her son, Kieran's best friend. The boys often played together on the weekend, something which Pauline didn't mind as it kept them out of her hair and allowed her to get some work done. On that particular evening, she'd pack the kids into the car to make the drive to Dale and back. It was nearing 8pm as they closed in on Ripperston Farm. The roads were dark and the hedges towered over the car. Trees formed tunnels over the road and made the darkness even more impenetrable. As far as Pauline knew, they were the last people alive. Such was the remote feeling of the area. The children chatted for a while, teasing one another before falling asleep in the back seat of the car. For this she was glad, as all of them had been suffering from nightmares over the previous weeks. Leanne had woken up twice in recent days, screaming and crying. Both times had caused the TV to overload and its wiring to burn out. On both occasions, Leanne had had the same dream of a giant shadowy figure waking her before drifting silently across the landing into her mum and dad's room. Pauline had never seen any of the children as frightened as Leanne had been on those nights. Leanne had also been insistent that she hadn't dreamed what she'd seen. The figure had actually been moving silently around the house. It was roughly two weeks since they'd seen the first light in the sky and Pauline was praying that nothing strange would happen on the drive home. In those 14 days, they'd been overloaded with weird goings on. As well as the TVs overloading, dozens of light bulbs had also blown, sometimes minutes after they were screwed into the light fitting. Billy was replacing fuses in the milking machines faster than he could put them in. The electricity bill was also starting to spiral out of control. Beside her, Kieran was uncommonly quiet. She asked him why and he pointed to the window of the car. I've been watching it for a while, he said. I can't make it out. What do you think it is? Pauline looked to where Kieran was pointing and almost ploughed the car into a hedge. For there, hanging in the sky, was the light that she'd seen a few weeks previously. 
At that point, Billy and herself had made the decision not to tell the children about the original sighting. The newspapers and media were already stirring the pot with news of flying saucers, and the news wasn't just coming from the area around Ripperston Farm, it was coming from all over the country. To tell their children that some of the phenomenon that they were experiencing, maybe because of little green men, was beyond imaginable. Deep down she'd hoped that her original sighting had been a flare or an aircraft from one of the nearby military places. But with the light back in the sky and above her car, Pauline suspected that she was seeing something far more than a mere aeroplane. She suggested to Kieran that it was just a plane or a star, to which he replied, Stars don't sway around like that, nor are they that orange colour, and plane lights don't look or behave like that either. Pauline knew that he was right. In December, six people had claimed to have seen something similar. And in the three months since then, more than 50 people had called the police to report mysterious flying objects. There had been so many sightings that one newspaper had dubbed the area the Welsh Triangle, in a nod to the Bermuda Triangle. But she didn't want to believe the stories. They couldn't be true. She didn't want them to be. The people who'd made the reports must have been mistaken. They did, after all, live in an area with a high military presence. And the military were doing goodness knows what behind the locked gates of their bases. It wouldn't be beyond reason for them to be doing some strange things in the air too. Pauline swung the car onto the final stretch of road that led to the farm. By her calculations, the light that had be- should have been behind them, somewhere in the distance and waiting to be forgotten. But it wasn't. The light was right there in front of them and appeared to be getting brighter. Its presence excited her son who couldn't help but point and exclaim that he could still see it. Finally, the sound of his voice grated on her final exhausted and terrified nerve and Pauline snapped. Kieran, she said, enough. Please stop being so daft. But he paid no attention. Instead, he continued to commentate on what he was seeing, telling his mother that the light which had caused her so much stress was becoming brighter and oddly moving towards them. She looked up to discover that the light had indeed grown brighter and appeared to be on the horizon. In that moment of terror and panic, she realised that they were driving straight towards it. Beside her, Kieran became panicked. He demanded to know what she was going to do, whether she was going to swerve and whether the light was going to crash into them. She screamed at him to be quiet and to let her concentrate. The road was notoriously dark, even though she was being dazzled by both the car's headlights and the light in the sky. The light that continued to grow brighter and go lower with every passing second. Pauline couldn't think. She couldn't think about her son beside her nor her other two children. All she could think of was the damn light that was growing forever closer and forever lower. She truly did believe that whatever it was would collide with them. She clenched at the steering wheel as she braced for the impact. The car was filled with a kind of science that could cut a knife. And, just before the light smashed into them, it lifted and skirted across the roof of the car and away behind them. Dear God, she exclaimed, what was that? What happened? Kieran, did it crash? Kieran turned to look behind them, but he could see no sign of wreckage. They were finally alone. In the car's rearview mirror, Pauline could see two silent and terrified children staring back at her. She slowly began to edge the car closer to the farm. They weren't far from home and she couldn't wait to get back indoors and put out whatever was outside to rest. Ma, Kieran's voice was quiet with fear. Ma, behind us. Pauline returned her gaze to the rearview mirror and felt her heart go into free fall. There, edging itself along her side of the car, was the orange light. She clutched the steering wheel even tighter as she tried to keep the cumbersome car straight. The headlights bounced from the hedges as she swerved left and right and behind her the children screamed. They clutched at the back of her seat, causing her to swerve across the road as the orange light continued to illuminate the side of the car. She instructed Kieran to get the twins off of her, but he only sat silently beside her with his hands clenched in fist and his head bowed. This caused the younger children to only become more hysterical, grabbing and clutching at her. As Pauline continued along the last stretch of road before the farm, she noticed that the car's headlights were dimming, then flickering, as though they were going to power down at any moment. Gripping the steering wheel and desperately trying to keep herself calm, she silently prayed, Please God, let the the lights last long enough for us to get to the farm. Through her tears, Pauline glanced to her right to find the light was still there and keeping pace with her. The farm was straight ahead, but the car was failing. The lights had gone out and the engine had stopped. 
The car was coasting along as they closed in on the farm. The only light came from the orange glow that continued to ride alongside them. And suddenly, even that was gone, plunging them into the thickest darkness that Pauline had ever seen. The car slowed to a stop and Pauline instantly went into survival mode. She told Kieran to grab the twins and to get into the house. She'd follow. They plunged out of the car and into the darkness. Pauline screamed up to the front of the house, hoping and praying that Billy would open the door. Once he did, she got the children in before following in their wake. With the door firmly closed behind them, Pauline told Billy and Clinton everything of being chased by the light that attempted to push them off the road before causing their car, like so many other objects in the house, to fail. The two men went outside and found the car still bathed in the white light that came from the orange orb. Clinton hadn't really believed his mother's story until he laid eyes on the light. Sensing that it was being watched, the orb took off and streaked overhead before disappearing somewhere behind the house. But it was going to get worse. Much worse. When the police spoke to the family, they said that it, they'd never met anyone who'd been so scared. Whatever was happening was shaking the Coombs family badly. Spring had finally eased its way to Ripperston Farm. The days had grown lighter and the nights shorter. The family was still sceptical of what was happening to them. They were, after all, just simple, simple farming folk. The weird and apparently extraterrestrial was something they had never really paid much attention to. Except that the weird and extraterrestrial was now paying attention to them. And had been for three months. The wiring in their house was now completely burned out. They had the entire house rewired after an electrician speculated that they were living in some kind of force field. Even though every appliance in their house was in perfect working order, they continued to burn out and the electrician wasn't sure how the family hadn't been electrocuted. No car mechanic could explain why the car had stopped working. In a similar vein, no TV engineer could explain why every TV that the family had bought into the house had also burned out. It was a Friday, the day that Pauline looked forward to. Thanks to Billy's half day on Saturday, they afforded themselves the luxury of staying up late to watch a midnight movie. Pauline could only hope that their current TV would last until the evening. Billy would be home late. He was trying to borrow a car from a neighbouring farm after their fourth car in three months had stopped working. One, one had been destroyed while Billy had been sitting in it on the garage forecourt. They weren't safe even when they were away from home. Darkness had fallen a few hours earlier and the clock was closing in on 10pm. Dinner was on the table and a fire was roaring in the grate when she heard the front door, door unlock and Billy walk in. He smiled as he walked in before discarding his boots and collapsing into a chair before the fire. Grateful to finally be ending the week, Pauline stretched out on the couch next to him. Western, is it? Billy asked in reference to the film on the TV. That's grand. Pauline smiled knowingly and wondered whether he'd make it to the end credits or fall asleep long before the movie ended. As always, she was right and within the hour, Billy was snoring loudly enough to raise the farmhouse's roof. But it was their dog, Blackie, who was worrying her. Normally he'd lie at Billy's feet, but for some unknown reason, the Labrador was unreasonably restless. From the lights that bounced off the darkened windows, it looked as though visitors were on their way. They hadn't invited anyone, and the incoming car may be why Blackie couldn't settle. She snuggled back into the couch and tried to ignore the bobbing lights as they grew closer. She was focused on the film and as much as she tried, she couldn't tune out the lights, nor Billy's snoring. Pauline did debate getting up to check to see who was pulling up to the farm, but it was nearly 1am. The film was nearly finished and doing so would disturb Billy. What's the matter, love? She'd been so fascinated by the lights outside that she hadn't noticed Billy wake up. Nothing, she reassured him. Billy commented on how the car was getting closer. Due to the length of the road and the expanse of land in front of the house, they were able to clearly see what was coming. He finally turned to check for himself, only to be repelled. Billy was instantly on his feet, his arms crossed over his eyes, as though trying to hide from something as he stumbled back across the room. Jesus Christ, what is that? He screamed. Pauline reeled in surprise as Billy's words rang around the room. She, str she strained to see what he was looking at and, as her eyes adjusted to the darkness beyond the window, she saw it. Standing directly outside of the house was a man, or the figure of a man. She could only see the bottom half of the glowing silver figure. The being was so tall that its head, or at least the top half of its head, was hidden above the window frame. What she could see of the face was black. There was no face or there was some kind of faceplate covering the head. There was just a rectangle of darkness where there should have been a face. The fear clutched her and her scream filled the room. She felt faint as she silently pleaded with Billy to do something. She tried to speak, to ask him to act, but her voice was caught in terrified screams. Go upstairs, he said. The fear was evident in his voice despite his desperation to remain composed. Go and see the kids. She did as he said and managed to work her way upstairs. 
Billy remained in the living room, the warmth of the fire tickling his skin as he stared at the glowing man outside of their window. The being hadn't moved. Instead, it was just standing and staring into the room as though waiting to be invited in. In his fear, he decided to put the dog outside. Blackie would protect them. He was a good guard dog. But Blackie, much like Pauline and himself, was terrified. The dog appeared to have the devil in him and was barking at Billy, his teeth barred and hackles raised. Knowing that he was at risk of being attacked, Billy reached and grabbed the scruff of Blackie's neck. He heaved the dog to the door and out into the darkness. No sooner was he outside than Blackie was streaking down the driveway, howling with his tail between his legs. With a heavy heart, Billy backed himself into the house and closed the door. He leaned against the door as he tried to compose himself, but the trembling started again and he was breathing heavily. Billy had never felt so alone and he knew that they needed help, outside help, like the police. But how? They were effectively trapped in their house by an unknown being standing outside the window, a being that was at least seven to eight feet tall. Billy dared himself to look. The creature was at the window just as before just standing and staring and then as slow as the coming of spring the towering figure lifted a gloved hand and pressed a palm to the window the fear filled billy and his throat was tight the phone was within reach but he couldn't move all he could do was watch as the window began to rattle around him the light started to flicker and the tv began to stream with some kind of interference his vision too was becoming blurred Billy lunged for the phone and somehow managed to call their nearest neighbour, Robert Morrison, at a farm just two miles away. Robert, thank God you're there. I need your help. I need you to call the police, he said in a breathless and hurried voice. Despite it being 1am, Robert agreed to go to Ripperston Farm. Once Billy was able to confirm that his neighbour was on his way, he hung up and dialed the police. Before they'd even managed to ask what service he required, Billy demanded that the police be sent to the farm as quickly as possible. With shaking hands, he replaced the receiver in the cradle and slowly turned to look at the window. The silver-suited spaceman was still there. Billy had never believed in such things. As he sat, Yet, as he sat staring at the window, he cast his mind back to a story that his nephew Mark had told Billy's brother Terry. Mark had been in a field behind his family's house when a silver-suited figure had emerged from a glowing red saucer-shaped object. Mark had stood transfixed as the figure had started walking towards him. Under the street light, Mark got a good look at the spaceman. He told Terry this figure, whatever it was, was very tall, had a square helmet with a black visor, wore a silver suit and had an aerial sticking up from one shoulder. And Mark was a responsible boy and not prone to flights of fancy. Billy peered at the window at the being that stood beyond it. He wondered if the spaceman that stood on the other side of the glass was the same one that Mark had seen. Billy averted his gaze from the window and tried to control the feelings of nausea that swept over him. He wanted to be sick. He wanted for the figure outside to be gone. Yet every time he looked, because compulsion was too strong to not look, the silver-suited figure was always there. Then, as though it was sensing that people were on their way, the figure just vanished. Didn't fade away, didn't walk away, just vanished. Robert reached the farm first with two young constables following in his wake. Pauline came downstairs with the children. She settled them on the sofa before joining Billy, Robert and the police. Much to Billy and Pauline's surprise, the policemen believed their strange tale. Turned out that over the previous weeks, they'd heard a number of bizarre stories, all of them relating to UFOs, odd lights and silver-suited spacemen. When asked if the policeman would mind taking a look outside, the two younger men gave Billy and Pauline a sheepish look. It turned out that the Coombs' terror had rubbed off on them, and while they were willing to take a look around the window, they asked that the front door was left open and someone kept watch so that they could dash back inside should anything untoward happen. By this point, the media were knocking down the door of Ripperston Farm. The day after day after their story about the spaceman at the window had been released, every media outlet in the country, in fact probably the world, had turned up with contracts in hand. All of them wanted the exclusive story of what was happening, not just on the farm, but within the Broadhaven Triangle. But it wasn't just schools, children, the Coombs who were experiencing strange things in the area. Rosa Grenville from the Haven Fort Hotel was noticing them too. The Haven Fort Hotel sits on the edge of the cliffs and has a stunning view of the bay. Built in a gothic style with slate roofs and arched windows, the hotel has 14 guest rooms and is a Grade 2 listed building. It was built in 1870 for the chairman of the Great Western Railway, although census records say the first owner was Mrs. Rebecca Goldwire in 1871. 
Her family owned the Broadhaven estate and the building was marked on the 1875 Ordnance Survey map as the Havens. Rosa called Pauline one night to tell her the story of what had happened outside of the hotel. One night she'd been alerted by a bright light and had gone to the window to see what was going on. Believing that it was poachers, Rosa stayed to watch and what she saw would stay with her for the rest of her life. There, in the field behind the hotel, was a spaceship with a dome on top. The light was so bright and so beautiful that, for a moment, she believed she was having some kind of divine revelation. Rosa even described it as being heavenly. But as her eyes adjusted to the light, she saw something else in the shadow of the spaceship. Walking around the field were what she described as two creatures. They were humanoids in appearance, although they were, she was reluctant to describe them as human. To Rosa, they appeared to be dressed in silver space suits, and, like encounters that other people had, they didn't appear to have faces. Instead, there was a black square where the face should have been. Even though she was terrified, Rosa couldn't help but watch. The creatures wandered a little and bent down as though to measure the grass. Once they'd done what they needed to, they returned to the spaceship and the light faded before the craft lifted off. Rosa wanted to report the incident, but her husband wouldn't let her for fear of them, fear of them being seen as mad. But the events weren't over for them, not by a long shot. The Coombs boys had been out shooting their air rifles when they came back into the house. Before Pauline could ask them why they were late, they told her a story that several weeks previously she wouldn't have believed. While they'd been outside, the boys had seen a man much like the one that Pauline and Billy had seen. A spaceman in a silver suit with a black space where its face should have been. Stunned into silence, the boys had watched as the being had floated, not walked, across the field towards them. They described him as glowing and said that they watched him just float straight through a hedge. Despite being scared, they decided to follow but found nothing in the next field. It was as though the spaceman had just disappeared. As they were standing at the gate, they noticed something else lurking in the shadows. A flying saucer with a ladder lowered to the ground. As they watched, the ladder had retracted and something that appeared to be a red box came out of the open hatch. The saucer then lifted off to be joined by another, larger craft. Both craft then took off at high speed and disappeared over the edge of the cliff. The boys went looking for the box but couldn't find it. What they did find, however, were patches of burnt grass where the saucer had been sitting. Patches of burnt grass that looked very similar to the ones that Billy had found on another part of the farm a few days earlier. Pauline savoured the silence. The kids were in bed and Billy was snoring beside the fire. With all that was happening and no way to stop it, she enjoyed every moment of peace and quiet. The kids weren't pestering her with questions about why the media were turning up at their door or why beings from other planets were standing outside of their window. Billy was getting some rest and, for a few precious moments, she could just enjoy the quiet. Because deep down she knew that the peace wouldn't last for long. The reports continued to roll in. Rosa had called again to say that since she'd seen the two spacemen behind the hotel, she'd also seen an orange pulsing light. She was convinced that it was related to the spacecraft that were harassing the area and not something related to the ships out at sea. One Milford Haven businessman, his wife and one of the neighbours spent five minutes watching a UFO the size of an airliner zigzag above their house. He said that he'd always laughed at UFOs but that one changed his mind. An older Milford Haven resident had spoken to the newspaper on the understanding that his identity wouldn't be revealed. He knew that he knew what he'd seen and didn't consider himself a nutcase but didn't want others to ridicule him. One morning he'd woken up at five o'clock by a light pulsating through the window. When he'd got up to investigate he'd found a giant silver egg-shaped craft swinging like a pendulum. It was at about rooftop height and roughly 40 feet from his house, 30 feet from the UFO and suspended in the air like a parachutist was a spaceman. Like Billy, Pauline and everyone else in the area, the unidentified man's reaction was exactly the same. He didn't believe in UFOs until the one event that woke him up. One of Kieran's friends, Stephen Taylor, who was regarded as regarded by all who knew him as an upstanding young man with no reason to lie, had also spoken to the newspaper about a sighting that he'd had. Stephen had been walking home from his girlfriend's house one night when he'd seen a dog race out of a field. He turned in the direction that the dog had come from, knowing that there was a farmhouse in the area. Except that there was no farmhouse. Where it would normally have been, there was nothing. He'd leaned onto the gate to take a close look, and as his eyes had adjusted to the darkness, he'd been able to make out the, sh the shape of a giant dome-shaped craft that had taken up half of the field. A dim light had been emitting from the object's underside. As he was studying the craft, he heard something that sounded like feet on dried leaves. He looked to his right to see where the sound was coming from and found something he thought he'd never see standing beside him. Stephen says that the figure was tall and skinny, roughly six feet in height. It was wearing a strange one-piece suit with a zip up the middle and appeared to be made from material that was both transparent and not transparent. But the strangest and by far the scariest thing about this being was its face. Stephen was probably the first person to see one of those beings without its strange 
blacked out helmet. He said its face looked like an old man's with high cheekbones, sunken skin and large round glassy eyes that appeared to be glazed. Over its mouth, the figure had a box-like contraption with a tube that went over its shoulder. Terrified, Stephen took a swing of the figure before turning and running. He didn't stop running until he got home and never once looked over his shoulder until the front door was shut behind him. He said that he went to pet the family's normally friendly Pomeranian dog only for it to growl and back away from him with its hackles raised. The dog was its normal self the following morning. Pauling was returning from a party and frankly glad to be back at the farm. They'd left Clinton to enjoy some of his day off alone and Pauline was happy that he was home as she'd forgotten her keys. With everything that was going on in and around the farm, Pauline was tired and had found herself becoming prone to forgetting things. When Clinton opened the door, she noticed that there was something a little off about him. When she gently pressed him, her son told her a story that by that point she well believed. First, he asked her if he'd passed a big silver car on the way up the drive. The driveway, which Clinton pointed out, was only wide enough for one car at a time, meaning that someone, probably Pauline, would have had to have pulled over. She frowned and shook her head. There had been no other cars except hers on the driveway. She didn't see nothing on the road that led up to the farm either. In the moments before she'd arrived home, it appeared that two men had turned up to the house. Both, according to Clinton, looked exactly the same with pale skin, identical black suits, identical dark slicked back hair and identical high foreheads. Both were tall and while one stayed in the car, the other got out and came to the house. Rather than walk, it seems that the man glided across the grass. Clinton didn't hang around to find out what the man wanted. He locked both front and back doors before going upstairs to hide. From his hiding place, he heard the man try both the doors before going to the small cottage next door. Carol, the nurse, who was away a lot and as such had been spared a lot of the farm's recent and traumatic events, rented the cottage. When Pauline heard this, she felt the colour drain from her face and asked Clinton to go and see her. Carol was more than happy to visit and Pauline was happy to see a friendly face. It had been a while since they had last had the chance to catch up so even though something strange had happened it was a good opportunity to see one another. And the story that Carol had to tell stunned Pauline. She'd watched the man walk around the house before returning to the front door to look up at the building. Trying to shake off the thought of someone roaming around their property Carol had taken a bag of garbage out to the bins. She said that she'd had a strange feeling that all wasn't right and was eager to get back inside. Except that the man was standing at her shoulder. Taken aback, Carol had just stared at him and, as she told Pauline, it took three to four minutes to get from the front of the house to the back, yet this strange man had done it in a heartbeat. Her description of the man was the same as Clinton's. Strange looking with pale skin, a high forehead, black suit and slick back hair. What he said to her chilled Carol to the bone. Where is Pauline Coombs, he asked. When will she be back? Carol was blunt with the man and said that she didn't trust him and was not going to disclose any information. Oddly, rather than pressing her, the man seemed to take her answer and return to the car. Carol watched as it drove away and a few minutes later, Carol, in her car, a few minutes later, Pauline, in her car, returned home. Like Clinton, Carol assumed that Pauline would have passed them on the way up to the farm. When Carol asked her who the men were, Pauline said that she had to be honest. She took a deep breath and composed herself before explaining that the men probably weren't human and were connected to the events that had been plaguing the farm in the wider area. Carol desperately tried to rationalise the day's sighting but as Pauline gently laid out all that had happened, along with all the sightings of strange figures, she slowly came round. As all of the information sunk in, she urged Pauline to do something, anything and not to keep the information to herself because all of them could be in danger. A few days later, Pauline found herself relaxing. She leaned against the kitchen sink and stared out of the beautiful view that they had. Carol was right, they needed to report the events to somebody, but who? The town was already in a frenzy and she knew that the police believed them, but still. For a moment, she could enjoy the view and forget about everything. She ignored the, f the phone when it rang, instead letting Clinton answer it. When he called for her, she pulled herself back to her feet and took the receiver from him. Rosa was on the other end of the line and she didn't sound great. I'm sorry to bother you, she said, especially with all that you've been through, but you're the only person I can talk to. Pauline reassured her that it was okay to talk about what was happening in the area, especially if it affected any of her friends. She heard Rosa sigh before the other woman began to twist another of the many tales that Pauline had found herself listening to. Yet what she heard didn't surprise her in the slightest. Rosa began to talk about how her daughter, Anna, was visiting from Madrid. Rosa had gone out and when she returned, she found Anna in a state that she'd never seen her in before. The young woman was terrified and shaking. Once Rosa had calmed her down enough, Anna began to talk. She spoke of a silver car that had suddenly appeared in the driveway of the hotel. The hotel had a gravel driveway, meaning that Anna should have heard the car arrive, but she'd heard nothing. One moment the car park had been empty, and the next the car had been sitting there. But the car wasn't what scared her. It was the men in the car that did.
One remained behind the driver's wheel while the other got out and approached their hotel. Once at the door, the figure that Anna described as looking waxy asked for Rosa. Frightened and unsure of what to do, Anna said that Rosa wasn't at the hotel. The man seemed happy with the answer and left. And much like Clinton's encounter with the man, Rosa arrived home a few moments later. Anna assumed that Rosa would have seen them driving towards the hotel, but like Pauline, Rosa had seen nothing. The car and the two men had simply vanished into the air. But Rosa had done something that she said she would. She'd asked their local member of parliament, Nicholas Evans, to contact the nearby RAF base and find out just what the hell was going on in the skies above their picturesque little town. Nicholas did, as she asked, and a few days later someone from the RAF showed up to the hotel and gave her a book of questions to answer on what she'd seen. He also asked her not to speak about her sightings. Then she received two letters, both in the same envelope. One was from Nicholas saying that he'd received a letter from the Ministry of Defence. The second letter was a copy of that one and said that even though there were RAF bases in the area, nothing untoward was coming from them and that there had been no records of unusual activity in the area. Pauline could tell from the tone of Rosa's voice that she was just as confused. It would make sense if what they were seeing was coming from the nearby bases, but of course the military would deny all knowledge. If they were involved, they weren't going to tell anyone, not even a member of the UK's parliament. No one was going to listen to them, and no one was going to help. August came and went without incident, much the same as July had. For Billy, the lack of UFO activity was a blessing, and for the first time since the beginning of the year, he was breathing easy. Pauline had just started her job at the packing factory. She did it for six months of the year, packing turkeys for the upcoming festive season. And while Billy was glad of the extra money, this time her working seemed to have an added bonus. He wondered if one of the many letters that they received in the wake of their experience was true. One particular UFO investigator had written to say that some people just attracted sightings. Often these people had strong psychic abilities and, more often than not, they were abilities that the person didn't know about. Ever since Pauline had gone back to work at the beginning of July, the sightings had stopped. Perhaps they were attracted to her. Perhaps she had abilities that none of them knew about. The summer holidays were in full swing and Billy was wishing that the kids would help out a little more. With Pauline working and him tending to the farm, time was tight and getting things done such as making dinner was difficult. He looked around for the carton of cigarettes that Pauline had bought just the day before. She always bought 200 cigarettes on a Monday and left them easily accessible. They'd gone missing a couple of weeks before and at first they suspected the kids. The other things that had gone missing included small sums of money that they stashed in a cubby hole, cardigans that had never been worn and were still hanging in the wardrobe and now a second carton of cigarettes. They didn't believe that it was the kids taking them. It was just one of those things and probably a product of being so busy. They were misplacing items. Those items would turn up at some point. Eventually, the door front door banged and Pauline walked in, followed by the kids. The kids were shouting and laughing, but neither himself nor Pauline told them to quiet down. It had been a long house, long time since the farmhouse had been filled with so much joyous noise. Billy had left Kieran to do some ploughing in the hot summer sun. With the day drawing to a close, Billy decided to go and find his son before grabbing a cold drink and a cold shower. It had, after all been a long day. Often he had trouble dragging Kieran off of the tractor. His son loved nothing more than use the farm's machinery but for once he found Kieran standing beside the stationary machine. He had his head lowered and looked as white as a sheet. He asked his son what was wrong and the answer that he received wasn't the one that he had expected. Billy had expected Kieran to talk about how the back of his neck was sunburned and he was ready to give his lecture about ploughing with his back to the sun. Instead Kieran began to spin a tale that he'd heard many times in the previous months but which still made the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end. Kieran had pulled up to the house with the intention of getting a drink. As he'd approached the front door he'd seen something moving inside of the house. On closer inspection Kieran had discovered that it wasn't any of his family nor any of their neighbours or friends. Instead some kind of black shadowy figure was moving around the living room. He described it as tall and thin and taking up more space than a large man but with no discernible shape. Instead, Kieran described it as an undulating-like liquid as it moved to the window and then the TV and finally over to the far side of the room. As he'd been the last person to leave the house and therefore lock up, Kieran knew that whatever was in the house wasn't normal and possibly wasn't of this world. Yet a week later, Kieran was back with another tale to tell. Billy found him crying in front of the cow sheds. The young man was clearly shaken and it took several minutes before he finally opened up to his father. His tale, like the ones from the previous week, was another for them to add to the list of strangeness that had fallen over the farm. He'd been driving up to the farm from the fields when a person had just appeared in front of the tractor, hadn't walked out from the hedges or behind the walls, but had just materialised on the path. The person he described to Billy was a woman dressed all in white with long white hair. Kieran was convinced that he'd hit the lady, but when he'd stopped to check, there was no sign of her. 
Billy swore his son to silence. He didn't want Pauline or any of the other family to be hearing about the newest sighting. It seemed that their months of peace and quiet were about to be broken. So it wasn't surprising that the British UFO Research Association were getting a wave of new sightings from the area. In recent weeks, an ex-RAF pilot had seen six UFOs flying in formation over Broadhaven, while a five-year-old girl had woken up her 11-year-old sister to tell her about the big helicopter with the rainbow-painted man that was hovering outside the house. When the sister had looked, she'd seen something like a thick black cloud from which a gold pyramid shape emerged. In a third report, a lorry driver described seeing two featureless figures standing beside the roads. The seven-foot-tall beings had been dressed in a red translucent material, had large heads with no features and humanoid-like arms. Both he and his passenger had described feeling a chill as they'd driven past. In the final report Billy had read in the newspaper, a mother and her 13-year-old daughter described seeing a fantastic display of UFOs over the harbour. The lights had flown back and forth, disgorging more before finally flying in over the mainland. They'd watched this display of five craft become nine for over 40 minutes. In those moments, the ones when the tales of UFOs were being recounted, Billy honestly believed that they weren't alone in the universe. And there were events still to come that would make him believe even more that there were forces far greater than humans watching over Earth. The late hours of the evening called Billy to the cowsheds. He didn't particularly enjoy visiting them and the area made him feel nervous. Long ago, the days before UFOs had started to visit, he'd have enjoyed the walk, but now... Even the thought of having to leave the house at night scared him, but there were pregnant cows that needed his attention and at least he could hide in the sheds from whatever was stalking the farm. Billy spent an hour with his cattle checking on them and making sure they had enough to get them through the night. Eventually he decided to step back out into the darkness on whatever lay within the inky shadows. The clock was getting ready to chime 1am when halfway between the house and the cow sheds, Billy heard the phone ringing. Perplexed at who could be calling at such a late hour, Billy sprinted back to the house and grabbed the phone before it woke his family. Martin Chambers, one of the neighbouring farmers to Billy, was on the end of the line and was, to put it mildly, angry. He seethed down the phone to Billy as he demanded to know how all 100 of Billy's cattle had ended up on his land at 1am, just moments after Billy had left them. Billy laughed and said that the herd couldn't possibly be his as he'd just been with them, but Martin was convinced that they were Billy's and they were causing a ruckus on their neighbour's land. And then Martin dropped the bombshell that Billy definitely hadn't been expecting. Apparently their neighbour had been calling him for over an hour to tell Billy about his escaped cows. Billy was defiant in that they weren't his cows and defended himself and his family against Martin's accusations that they had all been sleeping instead of stopping their cows from rampaging across another farm. Eventually, just to quiet Martin, Billy decided to go and investigate. The sense of isolation and fear grew as he approached the still-lit and bolted sheds. The night was dark and the feeling of foreboding grew with every step. Walking up to one of the sheds, Billy felt as though his soul had left his body because the shed was empty. The cows that had been in there probably a moment earlier were gone. Billy rolled back over the events and realised that his eyes had probably been only been off the cow sheds for 30 seconds, maybe a minute at most. There was no way that the cows could have escaped in that time. Billy slowly made his way back to the farmhouse and picked up the phone. Martin was still on the other end of the line, waiting for Billy to return. Unsure of what was happening, Billy quietly apologised. They were his cows, but he had no idea how they could come to be in Martin's fields. He told Martin that he'd be there as soon as possible and that he'd heard the cows back himself. But before he could leave... Billy found Pauline waiting for him with a cup of tea. She'd overheard the conversation and taken the tea from her, he told her what Martin had said. When he was done, Pauline bowed her head and clasped her hands. Do you believe me, Billy said. Of course I believe you, love, she quietly replied. But they're back, and it's happening all over again. Once their collective panic had faded, they talked over what they were going to do. Billy would go to Martin's and herd the cows back. They'd be locked back in the sheds. Pauline would stay with the kids in the house and stay awake until he returned lest something else happen. And so they did. Billy went and collected the cows and returned to Pauline holding another cup of tea. Once that was drunk they went to bed and hoped and prayed that nothing else would happen. But of course things did happen, although they weren't so evident at first. Despite Pauline allowing him to sleep in and get some rest, Billy felt himself slipping. His appetite disappeared and the herd were worrying him. They were more than a livelihood. He really did love them. But they were disturbed by something that he couldn't see. They were constantly agitated and charging unseen beings. One cow had injured herself by repeatedly running into an electric fence. The damage had been so great to her that Billy had no option other than to put her to sleep. And for reasons unknown, the cows kept escaping. It didn't matter how much they chained the gates or how many bolts they put on the cow shed doors. The animals kept appearing in neighbouring fields. 
understandably their neighbours were becoming angry at the constant invasion of their land. An invasion which, while it had the physical damage caused by the cows, was actually caused by something that none of them could see putting the animals in the field. One day, while going with Clinton to milk the cows, his son spoke and asked him what was wrong, yet Billy didn't want to say anything. Of course, Clinton was a young adult and had experienced the strangeness of himself, but Billy still didn't want to worry his son. They made their way around the sheds and to one of the fields. Sixteen heifers were patiently waiting to be fed, and as Billy and Clinton began heaving the bales of hay over the fence, so the cows tucked into their meal. Once that was done, they walked the mere six paces to the milking shed and flicked the machines on. As Billy turned everything on, he felt Clinton, who was standing behind him, grab his arm. Dad, you've got to see this. Billy felt himself tense up and dared himself to look behind himself. He knew that something had happened. He just didn't want to know what. He did look, and like so many times before, Billy felt his soul leave his body. The field they had just fed, 16 hungry heifers in, was empty. Completely empty. Half-eaten bells of hay remained exactly where Clinton and himself had dropped them. The gate was shut, but the field was empty. He wasn't surprised, there was no need to be. What he needed to do was find his cows before the neighbours were blowing up his phone again. Walking back into the milking shed, Billy found the relief appearing almost instantly. There, in another paddock close to the original one were his heifers. All 16 of them were milling around as though what had happened was a normal occurrence, which by that point, it was for all of them. Winter was drawing in when the family decided to have a pre-Christmas get-together at the farmhouse. Pauline had been avoiding the road along which the globe of light had chased her, even if it did mean taking a longer route. With Tina and her parents in the car, she was making her way back to the farm. Her mum, once outgoing and extroverted, seemed far more nervous and quiet. It had been Pauline's father a long time to convince her to return to the farm. The news of all that was happening had taken it out of them too. OK, mum, she asked. When she didn't get a response, Pauline glanced in the rearview mirror and found her mother sitting with her face pressed up against the window as though looking out at something. And finally, her mum softly replied, it's just that, well, I'm looking up there and trying to make out what's up here. And Pauline clutched the wheel tighter as the fear began to ripple through her once more. She'd taken the back route so as to avoid any of the weirdness that they'd experienced and hopefully shield the rest of her family from it. She hit the brakes and the car slid to a halt. From the driver's seat, she had seen nothing unusual. The area around them gave a perfect view of the sky and there was nothing. Yet her family was seeing something. Even Tina was leaning out of the window and gesturing wildly at something. They all piled out of the car and stepped out to stare into a perfect blue sky. Pauline could see whatever everyone was excited about and cupping her hand over her eyes, she stared in stunned silence. Hanging in the sky with the sun glinting off of it was a giant silver disc. The sight was fantastic, a quite perfect, slightly domed disc suspended in the sky and staying perfectly still. The flying saucer didn't move an inch as Pauline edged around the car in order to get a closer look. Slowly the disc began to move, gently swinging side to side as though it was a pendulum caught in a breeze. Slowly the sense of amazement was replaced with one of creeping fear, a knowledge that the craft would at some point begin to move. And when it moved, the car would inevitably break down. With one eye on the now swaying craft, Pauline herded everyone back into the car. Panic began to rise as she turned the key, the fear that the car wouldn't start heavy in her gut. When the car spluttered to life, Pauline put her foot down and headed for the farm. In the rearview mirror, she could make out the disc slowly beginning to inch its way closer. Behind her, she could hear Tina screaming and Pauline glanced at the object. The disc was now gaining on them and the panic, roar and blinding, took over. She drove as fast as she could, the car hugging the road as they threatened to tip over the cliff and into the sea below. Pauline didn't care. She wanted away from the thing in the sky and wasn't particularly bothered by where that was. If it was into the sea, then so be it. It seems that the disc had the same idea for it began to move in the direction of the sea and as suddenly as it appeared, it plunged over the edge of the cliff and seemingly into the water below. The sky was as empty and as blue as it had been before the silver disc had arrived. Where did it go? Tina whispered. I've no idea, love. Pauline pulled her daughter closer. Are you okay? Her daughter nodded and snuggled herself down. They drove the rest of the way back to the farm in a state of quiet relief. As the car rumbled onto the drive so Clinton came out to meet them, it turned out that they too had seen the disc. They'd seen it move and follow the car before disappearing over the cliffs. The chatter in the house among both her children and her parents was constant. 
Everyone had questions and everyone wanted answers. Neither herself nor Clinton could keep up. And herding all the children into one room, Pauline hung back to speak to her parents. She explained that the disc had come down somewhere on their land. While it appeared to have ducked down into the sea, the cliff edge was still part of the farm and it was her responsibility to go and look for the object. Her parents were understandably worried. Pauline talked them down by explaining that it would be best for them to go out while it was still light. Clinton eventually called her and with her son at her side, Pauline made her way down to the cow shed and across the fields to where they had seen the disc disappear. Together they stared out to sea and the pair of limestone pillars that stood in the bay. Yeah, there was nothing. There appeared to be no sign of where the disc had vanished and the only evidence of its existence was in their minds. Clinton broke the silence by nudging her. Mum, look, out at the rocks, what's that? Pauline peered at the twin pillars. There appeared to be something white standing on them, something which could at a glance look like one of the many birds that often nested on them. But this was November, and the birds had long since migrated to warmer climates. She held her breath as she squinted. Beside her, Clinton's voice became raised. Mum! Mum! It's a man! It's one of the men! he exclaimed. In his, she replied, it's one of those space-suited men that appeared at the window. The terror of that night shot through her, and she struggled to hold herself upright as the vision of the man who'd blocked out their window came crashing back. But she didn't have long to live in the horrific memory as Clinton pulled her back and pointed out a second white suited figure higher up the rocks. The second one appeared to be standing in a shadow, yet as he moved, Pauline noticed that the shadow didn't move with him. To their astonishment and shock, the figure was standing in a doorway, a doorway which appeared to have opened up from the rocks that they stood on. But as they watched, the shadowy doorway slipped away to be replaced by a shiny metallic surface. It seemed at least appalling that the doorway wasn't made from the rocks and sky, but from something that had been hiding from view. The spaceman had stepped off of that craft and onto the rocks via a sliding door that they'd seen, the shadows indicating when the door had been opened. She returned to the house with Clinton and there was no hiding what they had seen for it was written on their faces. She made tea and told them the whole story. It was while they were telling the story that Billy arrived home. Clearly concerned as to why lunch hadn't been made yet, Pauline took him to one side and told him about their morning. The colour drained from Billy's face. Why did it all have to start up again, he hissed. It's been so quiet recently. Pauline shrugged. I've no idea, love. She was just about to suggest lunch when the phone rang. Billy answered it before holding out the receiver to her. It's Rosa from the Haven Fort Hotel, he said. Pauline took the receiver and could already hear Rosa babbling away on the other end of the line. As she listened, Pauline was shocked to discover that Rosa had seen exactly what they had, except she'd seen it from a different angle. She'd seen the silver disc go skimming over the field before dropping off the edge of the cliff. What Pauline hadn't seen, but Rosa had, was some kind of doorway opening up within stack rocks, which was the twin pillars out in the bay, and the flying saucer had flown into it. She had also seen the silvery figures, and Pauline found a moment within Rosa's, bre- Rosa's breathless story to confirm that they too had seen the strange figures on the rocks. Rosa was relieved that someone else had seen what she had seen, but like Billy, she couldn't understand why, after three weeks of peace and quiet, everything was beginning to return. December arrived with a chiller winter. With it came carving season and Billy found himself out in the thick darkness more and more. The farm was isolated and away from the main towns and roads meaning that the only light came from the farm and the lights that they had around the farm. The feeling, the awe of the farm was unpleasant and had changed the moment the strange discs and beings arrived nearly 12 months previously. Just 10 days after Pauline had seen the figs on the rocks, his whole herd had disappeared again. Every single cow had vanished, only to be found on a neighbouring farm. With all of the stalls chained shut, there had been no way for the animals to escape. Just as before, they had vanished into thin, thin air and reappeared on the property of someone else. Billy didn't like making his nighttime walk anymore. At one point, being out in the cool dark air had been a pleasure. Now he watched and waited for something or someone to emerge from the gloom. Even on that night, as the promise of Christmas drew closer, his senses were heightened. But as he leaned into the cow shed and checked his herd, Billy had the feeling that they were, for one night, safe. Both humans and animals had a chance, if only for a single winter night, to breathe easy. The same couldn't be said for Clinton. Just a few days earlier, and not long after the figures had appeared on the rocks, Clinton had been over in one of the fields. He'd been strengthening some fence poles when a strange feeling had come over him. The winter sun had been bright and a shadow, that of a figure, had been cast alongside him. At first he thought it had been Billy coming to check on him, but when he turned around to address the person behind him, Clinton found that he was all alone. He raced back to the farmhouse to tell Billy and had vowed that he wouldn't go back out there alone. In the days following Clinton's experience, Billy found himself making the same walk that he was taking at the present moment. A walk that took him along unpaved gravelly unlit tracks through gathering dusk 
towards his cow sheds. On that particular night, as he'd been walking, he'd seen a column of light descend down to the path before him. It had started to move towards him before veering across the grass and towards the house. Stunned, he'd watched as the pillar of shapeless light had moved behind the house and vanished from view. He'd raced inside to tell Pauline of his sighting. A week later, she had the same sighting, albeit from the living room window, of something that lit up the dusk sky like day before vanishing a handful of minutes later. Billy wasn't surprised that they were all spooked. There was something in the air or the water or the land of the area that was attracting these things to them. To him, it felt as though they were being constantly watched or, at the worst, studded. Yet giving up the farm and moving somewhere suburban wasn't for them and never would be. Farming was in their blood and they would remain on the land he hoped for generations to come. He was relieved when he turned a corner and saw the lights of the house directly ahead of him. Everything was spooking him right down to the skeletal branches of the now bare trees moving in a gentle breeze. But there was something else amid the branches, something that flickered whenever the leafless trees moved. Were they headlights or a lantern? Billy paused to take a look only to find that what he thought were two separate lights, headlights for example, were two columns of light about the same size as humans but without any kind of shape. They were just there, shining through the gathering darkness. He felt so vulnerable just standing there and watching them. They weren't all that far away and when he turned he could see the lights of the house beckoning him back to its welcome embrace. Turning back to the two lights, Billy watched as in the blink of an eye they vanished. With his head bowed, Billy breathed a sigh of relief and turned towards the house. Pauline's voice caught his attention. She was calling to him from the porch and he told her that all that he was by the wall hidden in the shadows. Over dinner he told her exactly what had happened yet he wondered to what end all the sightings were for. What was the end game? Were they themselves in danger or were they merely being watched by beings from another planet? Despite having kept a low profile for the best part of a year, Billy was surprised when the next day Pauline told him that they'd be having visitors. The visitors weren't family stopping by for Christmas and luckily weren't visitors from another planet, but were people who wanted to talk about the UFOs. And it wasn't like they hadn't already been hounded. When the stories began to break in the local news, they were pestered with phone calls and letters from people wanting to know more. And the more the story spread, the more people that they knew, friends, family and locals, thought that they were making up the stories, but both Pauline and himself had kept their heads down and continued to go through whatever experience had taken hold of the farm. Still, he wasn't keen on having investigators prying into their lives. They were repeatedly spoken to everyone they needed to, including the local police, their MP and the local RAF base. The RAF, despite investigating, understandably denied that whatever was visiting the farm wasn't from their base. The strange thing was that while the public didn't believe them, the authorities did, and the authorities were as scared as his family were. As the UFO activity had quieted, so had the interest, and for the past few months there had been nothing but radio silence from the press and the public. That was until Pauline had called the local UFO investigator about their recent sightings. His name's Paul Palmer, Pauline said. We've never met him before, but he's coming down to the farm. He seems to know what he's talking about, and well, wouldn't it be nice to have some answers? Billy had to agree that he would love some answers, and as Pauline continued to talk, he discovered that they had more in common with Paul than just UFOs. Paul was a farmer in Norfolk, and the weekend was the only time he was able to take off from work to come and talk to them. He'd spent the evening stewing over Pauline, inviting someone to come and speak to them, but come morning, he changed his tune and told Pauline as much. He was happy that they had the opportunity to speak to people who would understand rather than ridicule them. Pauline had a number of theories as to why Ripston Farm and the Coombs family were being subjected to so much UFO activity. For one, UFO activity had been on had been increasing year on year, with reports coming in from around the world, and mass UFO sightings were becoming the norm. He also looked into where the farm sat and believed that it had been built on an ancient burial site as well, as being the meeting place for several ley lines, which are lines of energy which crisscross the globe and are often found to go through areas of interest including places of worship. Of course Paul had noted the nearby RAF base but he really did believe the family were having visitors for more significant reasons. For one the Coombs family were made up of a number of different people of varying ages. Many of them lived beneath the roof of the farmhouse and Paul believed that they were the perfect subject to be studied by life from the far stretch of the universe. But Paul had a suggestion that shot them to their core. He believed that the craft and their strangely suited occupants were stationed nearby, not necessarily on the airbase, 
but maybe somewhere near the cliffs or even beneath the water. It would explain why the authorities were brushing them off and clumsy attempts to cover everything up. The authorities knew that there was something happening but were powerless to do anything. The information made Billy and Pauline's head swim and in the following days Pauline found it difficult to sleep. Out there in the cosmos and yet also close by were beings far more advanced than themselves, beings who wanted to watch and study them. Pauline assumed that they were meant no harm but damn it if they weren't terrifying. Having Paul visit was both cathartic and useful. Along with his wife Janet, they helped Billy to herd the cattle into two fields for their morning feed. Once that was done, Paul, who commented on how peaceful and secluded the farm was, paused to tell Billy about a very vivid dream he'd had prior to visiting Ripperston. He dreamed that he was looking down on the farm and the bay. In his line of sight had also been the RAF base and the town of Broadhaven. Paul had said that he didn't dream often, at least not with so much clarity, but his dream had shown a cloud of gas gathering on the horizon and the feeling that he'd had was one of fear and dread as though the gas was coming to harm the inhabitants of the area. This had led him to believe that the dream was some kind of message and that maybe the beings from outer space were visiting to warn them of something bad that was going to happen in the area. Perhaps something relating to the RAF base. Perhaps something nuclear. Billy had hoped that nothing would happen while Paul and Janet were visiting, that their time on the farm would be spent talking about farming and, well, the strange and mysterious. But as they were walking back towards the farmhouse, Billy stopped them, his blood running cold, as he pointed towards one of their fields. One of their fields that had, until a few minutes before, held a herd of cattle that had been feeding on hay that was now strewn across the ground. The gates are, st the gates are still locked, Paul said. What in the blazes has happened here? Where are they? We saw them just a moment ago. Heck, we put them in that field. When Paul asked where they needed to look for the herds, the look on Billy's face said it all. They could be in an adjacent paddock, or they could be on a neighbouring farm, or they could have disappeared altogether. They returned to the farmhouse in science, and Pauline instantly knew that something was wrong. For a while, they drank tea and theorised on what had happened and where the cows had disappeared to. Once they had finished drinking, Pauline nudged them towards the door and back into a world that looked so normal, yet so very strange. Billy, along with Paul and Janet, drove first to Dale Farm. Billy explained that he had found the cows there during one of their disappearances, but this time there was no sign of the cows. So they turned and headed for the cow sheds on Ripperston Farm. Again, no cows. They tried Clover Farm and the sinking feeling in Billy's stomach said it all. The cows weren't at Clover Farm either and he was at a loss for words and ideas. Paul and Janet both tried to reassure him that the herd would turn up. They drove for another two hours, peering over hedges and into nooks and crannies that surrounded the open spaces, yet there was still no sign of the cows and they eventually found themselves back at where they had started, at Dale Farm. That's it, Paul said there's no sign of them. But his passengers didn't seem to hear him, instead their gaze was elsewhere and when Billy followed it, he saw what they were staring at. There, in front of Martin's house were a herd of cows milling around and they were his cows. He could identify them by the green and yellow tags in their ears. What the actual... His voice trailed off. In quite bewilderment, they all exited the car and stared at the cows. A moment later, Martin called to him, asking as to why the cows were, once more, on his land. Billy walked up to him and as calmly as he could spun a quick story about a new stable boy who'd obviously herded them the wrong way while he himself was entertaining his guests. Martin seemed to buy the story and once the other farm was gone, he breathed a sigh of relief and stared at Paul and Janet. We're not imagining it, are we? He asked. The cows weren't here when we last checked. Paul shook his head. No, they weren't, he replied. It took the three of them about 30 minutes to drive the nervous herd half a mile up the track and back into their own paddock. They worked in silence, none of them speaking. Once the cows were safely back into the paddocks, the three made their way back to the house. Pauline was waiting on the doorstep for him. Martin was on the phone and, by the lack of colour in her face, Billy knew that it wasn't good news. Martin confirmed that 15 minutes after he'd watched Billy, Paul and Janet drive the herd back along the track, the cows had reappeared in front of his house. Billy could feel the life draining from him as he listened to the farmer. Maybe check your gates and fences, Martin suggested. Might be somewhere they're getting loose. Billy murmured in agreement and resigned to moving the cows again. The three of them headed back out. Sure enough, his herd were back in front of Martin's house. For a moment, the three of them just stood and stared in absolute disbelief. The second disappearance of the cattle must have happened the second they turned their backs, yet none of them had heard, nor seen, nor felt a thing. The cows had silently vanished into thin air before reappearing in front of their neighbour's farmhouse. He wondered if, in that moment, some intelligence was sitting in the heavens above them, watching them become flustered, scared and stressed. They moved the cows back and checked all the fences and locks. Billy noticed something which unnerved him. Since they'd moved the cattle, it had rained. Yet there were no hoof prints in the mud. Pauline had made them more tea for their return, and they sat exhausted as they drank. There was little to be said. The herd had vanished into thin air, not once, but twice. They'd only been sat down for ten minutes before the phone rang again. The cows had vanished and rematerialised at Dale Farm for a third time.
During the course of the night, Billy was in and out of the house, continuously checking on the herd. Leaning against the work surface in the kitchen and sipping cocoa, Pauline stared out into the night. She waited once more for Billy to return. It was, she realised, the same kind of night as when all of the strangeness had first started. A night with darkness so deep that if she stepped outside, she wouldn't be able to see her hand in front of her face. Of course, both herself and Billy were waiting for something else to happen. The herd of cattle had disappeared and reappeared three times in the course of an hour. Something was coming and she quietly wandered around the house, turning on lights, checking windows and making sure that their scared children were managing to sleep. Pauline finally went to bed despite not being the slightest bit tired. She tossed and turned, changing her position frequently before finally managing to settle into some kind of rest. At some point she awoke and found a beam of light shining through the window. At first Pauline thought it to be sunlight and that she had managed to fall asleep but the beam began to move slowly across her body before resting on her hand. For a moment she stood at the back of her hand, the tiny hairs and the marks from a life of working on a farm. The light became brighter, much brighter than the rising sun and Pauline sat up to study it. She was wide awake and trying to comprehend what she was seeing. She found herself slowly letting her arms fall to her sides and focusing on the light before her. For some reason she knew that she needed to concentrate on it but she didn't know why. And then, as though in some kind of dream, she found herself sitting on a white plastic bench with her back pressed against a moulded plastic wall. The bench stretched away along the edge of a curved domed room. At the opposite end of the bench was a screen which flashed, flashed a series of lights. Red, blue, yellow, green. Red, blue, yellow, green. Red, blue, yellow, green. Red, blue, yellow, green. Pauline became aware of others in the room and was surprised to find that, to the right of the screen, in some kind of void, stood two figures who appeared to be women. They wore matching skirts and sweaters and had matching hair. The women slowly began to walk towards her and, in her dream state, Pauline felt oddly peaceful. She looked around herself and, through the dim light, saw something that looked like a ramp. And up the ramp, others slowly walked. Other people from the small towns and villages and farms that surrounded them. Feeling a presence at her shoulder, Pauline snapped back to and found herself, much to her horror, staring into the eyes of one of the women. Clear blue eyes, just like the ones that Clinton and Rosa had described from the visitors that had come to the farm and to the hotel. Clear blue eyes and high foreheads and the black sleek back hair that was longer than either of the other two had described. Pauline assumed that the being before her was one of the female of the species. The eyes continued to stare at her, unblinking and unmoving. Pauline felt calm and at peace. There was no reason to worry nor to stress. She stood to speak to the being and ask the hundred questions that were racing through her head. But as she did, the light began to fade. It became dimmer and dimmer until Pauline found herself once more in bed. December 14th, 1977, 11 months after everything had started. By that point, Billy was thinking of selling up Ripperston Farm and moving himself, his family and all of his livestock elsewhere. The planning and logistics were unimaginable and Billy felt too old to even attempt such a move. His mood was lightened by Pauline bringing him breakfast in bed. She never did such a thing. In fact, he was fairly sure this was the first time she'd ever bought him breakfast in bed. When he asked the reason why, she replied, because I can. There was something about the farm, something Billy couldn't quite put his finger on, but which he would describe as calmness. A peaceful silence hung over the area as though any agitation and stress had simply melted away. Unnerved by it, he took up Pauline's suggestion of driving to Dale, 13 miles away, to visit her parents. The evening was a beautiful one, verging on the cusp of winter, and it seemed like a nice idea to get out. It was on their return journey, a journey that was driven with a pensive silence when Kieran nudged them. Billy could feel that both he and Pauline wanted to talk about what had been happening. They wanted to dig into it all and unpack the strange events and how it had affected them as a family. Would they move, or would they stay put? Kieran's voice was the one that broke his thoughts and they glanced out of the window to see a dazzling bright yellow ball racing across the starlit sky. Mesmerised they watched the car slow into a crawl before they finally stopped. They all got out to watch somehow knowing that it wasn't a comet nor a meteorite nor a satellite. It was something completely otherworldly and as they stopped so it began to drop towards the horizon until it disappeared behind a bank of trees. There was a sudden twang of panic in the air because beyond the bank of trees and in the direction the light had gone was their house. They got back into the car and crept the rest of the way home expecting to see the ball of light on the ground before their farmhouse. The farmhouse was lit up just as they'd left it and the cow sheds were lit with a gentle glow of night lights and there hanging above the cow sheds was a ball of light. 
Without saying a word, the family once more got out of the car and stared at it. Yet for the first time in nearly a year, there was no panic and no fear. All of them were in awe at what they were seeing. When Kieran went to say something, Pauline gently shushed him. Instead, they stood and allowed themselves to be bathed in the orb soft light. It's going, Pauline murmured. Look, it's going. All of them stared at it and waited. There was a sense of wonder in the air of excitement and of happiness. With a speed that took all of them by surprise, the orb suddenly shot off into the night and vanished amid the stars. It's over, Pauline quietly said as they entered the house. Billy looked at her, confused. How do you know? Oh, I just know, she replied with a smile, before telling him of her dream the previous night. A dream, Billy asked. Pauline said nothing and smiled. But no one could fail to notice the puncture-like blemish on her forearm. The story is now over. The craft and those that travelled in them vanished as quickly and as dramatically as they arrived, but the mystery that they brought with them remains. There still appears to be no explanation for what happened to either the Coombs family nor the Broadhaven area. Military, government and local authorities denied any involvement and the story has now gone down in local, national and international law as one of the biggest and longest running UFO experiences of the 1970s. We can only assume that everyone in Broadhaven experienced something that was truly out of this world. And that, my friends, is the tale of the Broadhaven Triangle. If you like your stories a little bit off the beaten track, please do visit our website at www.roswellpublishing.co.uk. And until next time, happy Halloween. Have a good one, a safe one, and enjoy yourselves. See you next time. Bye.